Hey, before we jump into this week's video, I want to put a quick announcement about Tobacco Advent. It is coming up during the month of December. For those of you that don't know, from December 1st through December 25th, we smoke a tobacco a day, post a video a day, in addition to our weekly, regularly scheduled Marco Men's Breakfast Club Wait, videos. where do we get this tobacco? That's a great question. Uh, that tobacco comes from viewers like you. Uh, what we ask, if you're interested in participating, is send a small sample of your favorite tobacco, um, just enough for a pipe each. We'll smoke it, we'll talk about the tobacco, we'll answer a question, and we'll post that video every day throughout the month. Um, in exchange for that, we want to send you a gift of a... Is it cornament. a gift? It's a cornament. It's a cornament. But is it a gift? I don't, it's not a gift. It's well, a, well, you know, with the FDA... FDA with the FDA... Doesn't matter. Right? No, no, no. The FDA, yeah. they, they, they have a problem with free tobacco samples, so... But you're there on a business. We're, we're, but we're exchanging, Okay. Right? We're going to exchange a cornament for your tobacco sample. We'll, we'll get send that you a cornament. You. you can't smoke it, but you can put it on your tree. Put and you can you smoke can't. it if you want to. <laughs> I mean, what you do, that's not the purpose of it. Once you do what you ha once you have it, is uh, your problem or your decision. It's a free country. Anyway, uh, that's coming up soon. If you'd like to participate, there will be a dre an address down below for where you can send the tobacco sample. And uh, we hope that you will participate. It's a lot of fun. If you go back, we've done this for the last five or six years. have had lots of uh, great conversation within the community. And so we hope that you will do that. But now... Back on, to, with, on with the show. <laughs> on with the show. Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth here as well. <laughs> Welcome to Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. So I'm, I still, I, I prefer it when you say that you're from somewhere. Nope. Why? I don't know. It's something about the, the rhythm. Uh, right. what, do, what do you think? Should, should he say he's from somewhere or I'm not? not though. I'm not, not from anywhere. And I also miss... Maybe you should stop saying where you're from. I also miss... Maybe you should just I say, hi, Scott and Seth here. They're, they're a third of Mark Men's Breakfast Club. Because there are so many of them. There are over 2,000 of you right now. There are over 2,200 of you right now. So it's not just the three of us. It's the three of us and many of our friends in the pipe community. Yeah, but see, but when I'm talking to them, I'm, no. I'm, talk, I'm thinking about just that one no, person. No, but, but they're not alone. It's a large breakfast club. It's a, it's a breakfast club of many, not a breakfast club of three anymore. I feel like that many is a third of us. Well, no. Nope. That's how I mean it. That's how I mean it. Uh, yeah. When I say that you're a third of Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. Right? Yeah. Except that that's not math. So <laughs> just like I'm not from a place, even if I say that I am. And you say that you're from a place, but you don't have to say you're from I'm a actually, place. I say I'm from, I'm from a website. I'm really right. not and from. So you don't you don't have to say that you're website. from that website. I don't know. This is one I definitely need you to weigh in on. Um, if you've been around a while, you you know that that's how I used to introduce this. I would say that uh, you know, together the three of us are Markwood Men's Breakfast Club, but but boy said that you know that's not correct. So I've pretty much this year. Mm -hmm. Had yeah. stopped saying that, but I, I prefer to say it because that's how I think of you. But it's not true. What I pointed out is that we are a, a much larger group. At and that's this point. and you know what that and is. It's, it's wonderful. That it's exciting, exciting to us to get to to feel like and be like we're part of a club. Yeah. What well, only weenie clubs have three people. Really, really tiny clubs of three. Um, speaking of weenie clubs, I'm Seth from My Wiener, Your Mouth. <laughs> Brought it back. And what are we smoking today? All right, so I got me a yabo, I got me a yabo, I got me a yabo. Hey, 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 hey. So, um, by the way, just to clarify something, uh, the word yabo was invented by our buddy, uh, J D I G H S X quite a number of years ago. Yeah. And it actually came from, talk about nerds, something that he was involved in with a bunch of computer guys. And it was an evolution or a, a deviation from mm -hmm. the whatever word that they used to mean something completely different. He was doing a lot of box openings on his channel and, and realized at some point that he'd been doing a lot of box openings. And so he said, hey, I'm here with yet another box opening which became Yabo. Yep. So yet another box opening is what a Yabo is. Well then, I, 
I, I posted a video not long ago. We were together mm -hmm. where I opened that 100-plus-year-old pipe. Yep. And I had somebody either comment or send me a private message saying, that's not really a Yabo because you purchased that yourself. It buying was John. Something, buying something. The Northern Bohemian who said it. Is not a Yabo. In the comments. So I, I knew how I felt about that, but I thought, just for fun, I'll get Jay on the horn. So Jay and I were talking this week on Voxer, and he said, uh, no, anytime you open a box, it's a box opening. So absolutely a Yabo. Now, where, where Jay and I split is in the opinion of, if it's your first box opening, he's of the opinion it's not a Yabo. I'm of the opinion that it is because it's within the community. Oh, right, right, right. It is another box opening for the community. So however you choose to view it, if, it, if your first one doesn't count, then fine, just get it out of the way, right? But after that, you're doing yabos. This so, feels like an awful lot of stupid <laughs> nuance for no purpose. <laughs> We're opening a box and everyone's going to get to see what's inside. Is that, is that summarize? Got me a yabo. Got me. <laughs> you know what? There are folks in the YouTube pipe community that have always wondered what the heck a yabo is. Yes. And there you go. And uh, I'm opening a box. Therefore, it is a box opening. I've done many of these. And this is uh, yet another. So here's what I've purchased. I have purchased for myself, so it's still a Yabo, several Amphora tobaccos. Now, the original, I used to smoke a ton of this 20-some years ago. And then whoever was importing this stopped importing it, and it wasn't available in the U.S. Yeah, didn't it get to and be quite a quite a big deal, uh, like a, a popular, rare? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Folks were bringing it back from Europe and things like that. Uh, so it's been back for a while now, but what they were promoting was the fact that they have a new flavor. So there's there's the original. This is full aroma, which I think is like the original. Hmm. And then this is their Black Cabin dish. Now, where's the new flavor? I didn't buy it. No, oh, cool. The new flavor was a straight Virginia, which neither of us seemed to care for straight no. Virginias. So I thought, why bother? But the price on this was good, so I went ahead and bought these. And we'll spread this out over the course of the next few videos. Cool. So that said, since we're going to smoke we <laughs> Yeah. Pick, pick, I a, don't, pick a hand or uh, middle. Um... Left hand. Left hand, we are smoking full aroma. Cool. We'll get back to you guys later. And I'm going to smoke this. Oh, I don't know. I guess I'll smoke it in a... Real pleasure, just moments away. Yes. I'm That's gonna, uh, my calling card. I'm going to smoke this in a Bent Country mm -hmm. Gentleman, which does not have an Aristocob bend. This is the stock bend that I don't like, but uh, I don't have any extra... Huh. Bent Danish bits here, so that's what it's going to be. The smell. Yeah? It smells nice. It's a real rough cut, right? Um, so it means it's probably going to be a little tough to get burning, but it will burn a long time once you get it going. Yeah, it's, it's kind, kind, kind of a lot like a flake. Yeah. You probably don't need that much. It's not. It's up to you, but you probably don't need that much. It's not, uh, it's not that bad. I'm not saying it's bad. All right. So, to talk about this week, you know, I've, I've talked about this over on the Aristocob channel a little bit, but we didn't get a chance for you and I to talk about this, and that is the, um, the Sutliff tour mm -hmm. that we did in Richmond and the Richmond Pipe Show. And uh, it was such a great time that I'd like for us to talk about it again. Okay? And, and also, leading up to this, um, we almost immediately after that, both Seth and I, on two separate business trips, wound up far, far away. So he and I haven't had a chance to talk to each other about this. So um, we've, we've been... Except for the three-hour drive home. <laughs> well, you, you guys saw the... Um, if you've seen the last couple of videos, you saw the... The video two weeks ago was actually from the tour, was a video of the tour uh, with kind of voiceover of, of the process from Sutliff, what we learned about the process of them making tobacco. Um, that was just 
so cool. Yeah. That was really, really fascinating to see all these things that, um, you know, you're, you're familiar with parts of it, right? You're familiar with the different cuts of tobacco. You, you're, you're familiar with kind of the bending, blending process from your local tobacconist maybe, but seeing it done on that scale, seeing how the raw tobacco comes in just as dried, fall apart in your hand leaves to, um, you know, how they are cutting it and how that's regulated and uh, just top to bottom, the process was just great. Now, what was interesting about that too is they even acknowledged that they are kind of a, um, I don't want to call them a boutique blender, that would be more like Cornell and Deal, but um, comparing them to like Lane Limited, he was saying that there you'd have a, a, a much larger scale of production going on than what they have there. But that oh. that also, oh, a filter. That's why oh. it's such a tight draw. That's nasty. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he, he actually gave a little bit of a comparison to what the they do versus what Lane is doing. And um, gosh, I lost my, my train of thought. I'm sorry. I, I'm I sorry. I believe you had a filter in there. I'm sorry. Try not to do that. <laughs> that means... That's been in there for several smokes. Mm. Yes, and, and I don't know when the last time I smoked this. It's been in there for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we could take this moment. Why do we generally not use the filters? Well, I can, the filter there to, I can tell you doesn't from, make it safer? I can tell you from operatingaristocop.com, we sell a lot of filters. Most of the filters we sell, though, are for folks from outside the United States. Most of our domestic customers do not buy filters. Uh, and I, I argue that if you pack your pipe correctly, the smoke is passing through that packed tobacco and it's letting off some of the things that you don't want into your mouth. And you know that by how nasty the dottle is. That last little bit of tobacco that is just so saturated with tars and nicotine and gunk, right? Uh, but there are people that argue that because this was designed to have a filter, a six millimeter diameter filter, about that big of an area here is, is a bit too large. So it acts as a calabash. It mm -hmm. acts as a chamber where it'll maybe drop off some of the moisture, which I don't think is bad. Mm -mm. Um, as long as that moisture, cool it? as long as the moisture doesn't come all the way up and catch you on the tongue, right? Which can happen. It's very, very rare as someone yeah. who doesn't use doesn't smoke with a filter. It's very rare that that happens. So to me, the, me. the the best thing a filter does is it it does capture some moisture, but it doesn't capture all the moisture. Otherwise, it, smoking wouldn't be any fun. You, mm. You've got to have some humidity in that smoke. And um, if you look at a filter or take one apart or look at one of the videos on my channel you'll see that there's a huge hole in in wood, I'm sorry, in the paper filters where the majority of the air just passes right on through right. the filter. Um, if you're talking about like a, a balsa wood filter, they're triangular and it just passes or right they're through. round with grooves on them right. and the air is pa majority of the air is passing beyond that filter and sure. some of it is going through the balsa wood and past the balsa. So as it's passing the balsa, it gives off some moisture. But back to what I started to say, a lot of folks say that because this was designed to have a filter in it, it would smoke better with that constriction of the filter. And um, you're welcome to have that opinion. I'm of the opinion that it, that if I pack this a bit tighter than I would, I'm getting the same restriction. Right. So I don't smoke with filters unless I have a tobacco that I like, but it's too strong. And that happens mm. sometimes. If I have one that I like that is too strong and I want to smoke it, I'll smoke it with a filter, and that filter will mute some of the flavor, which some, is what a lot of folks would argue against a filter. Does it does it mute the nicotine hit that uh, you get? I don't know. When I think of filters, you know, thinking cigarette filters it, it, and, and car filters, it... it seems like and feels like the purpose should be to make it healthier you know to to take out some of the tar some of the, the nicotine some of the other stuff i'd be interested i've not ever done any research I'd be interested to know if there is any sort of net effect um, well, cigarettes with, for with sure filters like Cigar this. cigarettes a hundred percent of the smoke passing through is passing through 
that filter, which is is basically let's call it cotton. Right. right? It's not cotton, but it's, we'll call it cotton. Right. Where there are, uh, to my knowledge, there are not pipe filters that work that way. Yeah. Um, there are some that have little that are uh, little granules of clay or of charcoal. The Europeans use a nine millimeter diameter, which is huge, a nine millimeter diameter filter that yeah. often has a lot of that stuff. It still doesn't stop the smoke because you're still blowing out smoke. Right. So, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. I totally derailed derailed the conversation about the tour. What tour? Um, so, for those of you that don't know, I think we've talked about it, but uh, just as a recap, we, the um, uh, Richmond, Virginia Pipe Show is one that has happened for a lot of years. They stopped a couple of years ago because of FDA requirements, deeming requirements, and, and th there was just a lot of uncertainty with what the FDA's um, new stipulations would or would not allow of a pipe show. And so this year they announced they were going to be putting it back on. Uh, Sutliff said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'd love to, we'd love to, to help with that and maybe draw a larger crowd. We'll open up the doors of, of our factory for a tour and Beyond that, they said, hey, uh, you guys can come here. We'll provide lunch. We'll give some samples. We'll let you blend your own mm. tobacco. I'd love to give samples. Well, you you could purchase, you had to purchase a ticket, and your ticket got you the access to samples and other things. Um, the tickets were, what, $1? I think we paid a dollar. Uh, no, we paid five. We paid five. Okay. I think. I think it was a buck. I think it was, I think it was a dollar piece. It could know. be less. Whatever. Um, however much it was, you know, we did pay, um, so it was all above board, but they provided lunch, they um, had this uh, room that they had tables and chairs and things set up. They just, as far as, as, far as um, having a gracious host, they were amazing. They were so great. All of the staff there was just wonderful. It was a Friday, so it was a working day. It was right? a working their, day their for whole, staff. Everybody was there. And we, when we spoke with Jeremy, the president, the next day, um, he said that, that it was actually such a benefit for their staff. And even if, even if we hadn't benefited, he still would love to do it and was glad that he did it for the benefit to his staff because many of them work in the office. They don't live in the YouTube pipe community. They don't live um, as customers, really, of the products they produce. And so he said it was a great opportunity for them to see who uses their product, who, who their customer is. Um, really just stellar. Yep. Stellar of them to do that. So. What was your favorite part of that, that day? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 and I really enjoyed, really enjoyed the whole day. It's a cop-out answer, but everything from walking up, we, we shot a video the night before and um, somehow it had gotten around the offices there and so people knew us when we walked up uh, to, to, to check Somebody in. Somebody just Googled it, I think. Well, they Googled, they Googled the show. It was the first video that had post, popped up and um, yeah, they watched it. That was neat. Going through the plant was neat. I mean, for me, kind of being a nerd, I really enjoyed taking the slow mo fo footage of the uh, the blade chopping. That was that was fun, um, and then even dinner that night. We went out. It was a dinner, and and got to meet a couple of guys who turns out they're from North Carolina, and um, got to just had a really good conversation. We we were the last ones there yeah, on the patio did. that we night. We closed it, did we? Yeah. Barbecue restaurant that was good. And then we went and saw Mission Impossible, so yeah, it was a good, good, good trip. Yeah, it was the last showing of the night, Mission Impossible. What did we walk out of there? It was like twelve mm thirty. -hmm. It was twelve thirty, right around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the next day, we we went and the local Moose Lodge was putting on the the show. Apparently, it's they weren't putting on the show. Well, I mean, they, they it, were, it was it was, was at the, it was yeah. a venue. They weren't yes. putting on. It was a venue. Um, and it was, they said smaller, a lot of people said it was smaller than the last years that the show had, had gone on, but I think they said the last time, the last year for the show was, what, 
20, couple years ago. 2013? A couple years ago. Um, but the same people who said that it was smaller yes. said they were really impressed with how many were there. They were glad That's to exactly see right. it came back as strong as it did. How many tables would you guess were, were there? Mm. 20, 30? I'd say, I'd say 30, 40 with okay. vendors. Yeah. So Sutliff was there, Lane was there. Lane, you know, they, they do their typical thing where they bring 30 or 40 different blends and you could buy a little coupon mm -hmm. sheet for, was it a dollar? It was a dollar for four samples. A dollar for four samples. How much do you get? You get a couple bowls, right? You don't get an ounce or anything like that. And uh, so we bought a bunch and yep. made that, that thrilled them. They didn't, they didn't care for that. No, they didn't. They didn't. I, I think that they felt that maybe we took advantage of the situation, to which we would say, yep, sure did. We didn't take Was, as much advantage as we, we would have. <laughs> uh, we had 16, talked about. 16 coupons? Yeah, we, we, we had 16 coupons. We asked them to just pick, really, uh, a sampling of flavors. We'll use those to smoke throughout the, the rest of the year, probably. Um and but you know as we were sitting there doing the math i think they said it was an ounce per per coupon and so homer's running the math about the five pounds of lane one q yeah and and thinking wow oh, wow i could really get a good deal if, uh, on five pounds of one q <laughs> just bought bought uh you know fifty dollars in coupons and, and be about the same as what he bought online We heard them discussing it there mm -hmm. behind the table that uh, this really isn't the way this was supposed mm -hmm. to work. You know, years ago, my wife went to Kroger's and Kroger's had a salad bar set up and you could fill up the, a little styrofoam tray or clamshell thing and then it was like a buck ninety nine a pound. And she's walking past the salad bar and she notices there's a big old thing of... of uh, um, what kind of cheese? It would have been, no, 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 for pizza. Mozzarella cheese, shredded, and a bunch of pepperoni. And at that time, both of those things were far more expensive than $1.99 a pound. So she filled up one of those things full of cheese and pepperoni. There you go. She got home, and I'm like, why did you do that? That's not what that's there for. That's that, you know, those are salad toppings. And she's like, I didn't put the bar out there. I didn't right. set the price. Yep. yep. So, <laughs> it was it was an ethics uh, debate we had in my house for a while. I yeah, I mean that's that's the risk you run as a business of of setting something like that up a sweet deal. Um, they could have said limit limit eight, right? right? That's exactly right. There's if they if they put a limit on the next one that you attend next show, we're the reason. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know the, the the risk that the business takes is that that you're going to have one customer like that for every 100 that does it the way that they plan. And so they still come out on top. Really? We, we went to we went to the Mongro Mongolian, I can't Mongolian? not say it, Mongolian Grill recently, and um, you get a single bowl, you go through the bar once, and then they cook the food. And so, you know, on keto, we are certainly eating more than our fair share of the meat, meat stuff. I mean, it was just like the steak, steak, shrimp, steak, steak, shrimp, um, chicken, all loaded up. Yeah, our server comes over and she says, and there's 27 different vegetables. All right, we'll be avoiding those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but for every for every person who's loading up on meat, there's there are people that are loading up on the veggies. Did you just see my, my picture? I, I did confirm. I did. The uh, Mongolian place, this is, uh, it's called Genghis Grill. In Winston-Salem, they have an all-you-can-eat or unlimited version where you, uh, for I think, Fourteen ninety nine at mm -hmm. dinner time. They give you a large bowl to fill up, and then any refills they move to a smaller bowl. You can't take anything home with you, so that's to keep folks from, you know, filling up and then doing a doggy bag. Sure. At lunchtime, it's the exact same thing, but it was twelve ninety nine, and um, it's really good, mm -hmm. really good, and that's a heck of a deal. So when we were in Richmond, we saw that there was a Genghis Grill, and I said, Seth, we got to go to this place. You'll like it. They didn't have an unlimited version, so we went through the line and we just meet it up. Yep. And uh, you know, at, once you hand your your raw meat over to them to cook, you can then add a, add several things. Most of the things are rice and and 
noodles and things that we can't eat, but one of them was shredded cabbage. So yeah, throw some cabbage in that. They'd also add eggs to it too. So yeah, even even at the fifteen dollars for Perfect one deal. for one serving, heck of a deal. It's a good deal. It's it's difficult, you know, doing keto. So many meals, um, the filler are, are carbs, and so you know, you go out to a hamburger place. I can get several hamburger patties and bacon and cheese and avocado and toppings and things, but to do that costs three dollars per extra patty. And, and it ends up costing $20 for a hamburger that you can eat because normally you'd fill up with fries, you'd fill up with a bun. And so it's great to go to a place like that where it's kind of easy to, to get a good keto meal out of it. It is weird so, when you think about that, when you start looking at what it is we're eating and that if you strip it down to just the protein, mm -hmm. you, man, we don't get much protein when you're just you know going and and getting a, a biggie-sized whatever mm -hmm. at the drive-thru, uh, you're getting a heck of a lot of carbohydrates. Yep. So there was one other thing that I, we haven't talked about yet, really. they um, Part of what Sutliff did is they set different tobaccos out. They, they, they set um, the raw uh, tobacco out, unblended tobacco. Uh, actually, before we're talking about that, one thing that I found fascinating is their factory is working at about a quarter of the capacity it used to 50 years ago um, when it was built. You know, it used to be such a, a, a huge plant. And so to they, they a lot of the building is now warehouse space because they just don't have the need for that much um, production. But what I thought was interesting is how much third party um, tobaccos they manufacture. You know, they're they're manufacturing for a lot of a lot of the brands that you would think uh, that you're familiar with. They're blending the tobacco, same tobacco usually in house. You know, using a different a different blend mix, and then slapping the stickers on and shipping them out. And so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, now that's the other member of what he was telling us about how he's seen reviews on yes. uh, tobaccoreviews.com. Mm -hmm. He said he's seen reviews where. What he knows is the exact mm -hmm. same product with a different label on it, where people are loving two on, different on, brands, loving on one brand and yeah. hating on the other brand, and it's the exact same tobacco. Yeah, yep. So again, kind of goes back to the Lane One Q that gets labeled as different things. Yeah. Oh, uh, you might like Lane One Q, but boy, you would really like Brendan's Choice. Right, right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, it's Lane One Q. And, yeah. And and people would pay a premium for their for, store's mm -hmm. blend of Lane One Q. Yeah, one of uh, so you know along those lines, we were talking about um, the FDA guidelines and what what impact that has had for them. One of the things that was fascinating is they are lucky enough as a manufacturer to have a back catalog of blends, and with the FDA's deeming regulation, they said anything that was, has not been manufactured since two thousand seven um, has to go through a new review process but they open up a window where you can kind of grandfather your old stuff. They just had in. to register it and pay for they it. They had to register. Paying for the registration was about $1,000 per blend. And so they, they went and they said they have 150, roughly 150 blends that they no longer produce, produce, but they have registered so that in the future they can release those uh, uh, maybe under new names or as different blends or really just have them available. Because they said in order to make a new blend, they, they talked to their lawyers about it. If they were to come up with a new blend of tobacco, it would take three years to get the registration approval and a million dollars per blend. That's insane. That's absolutely crazy. So uh, I hope that you like what everyone has been smoking <laughs> for the last 100 years, 50 years, because that's all we're going to get. That's the new stuff now. Um, it's it's crazy, and that's the same law is is going to deeply deeply hurt and impact the vaping community. Um, you know, right now they said it looks as if the uh, cigar manufacturers are not being hit as strictly as the, the tobacco cigars, as yeah. the tobacco guys. Um, so that's that's a way that the, the steaming stuff that we've talked about for years now is affecting us as, as pipe smokers. Now, Sutliff 
itself is owned by Mac Barron. Mm-hmm. So you you may be a fan of Mac Barron Tobacco, mm-hmm. as we are. Uh, that's now the parent company of Sutliff. Mm-hmm. So also going through the tour, we saw quite a bit of Mac Barron product that was uh, the warehouse there and being fulfilled with yeah for wholesale customers. They don't sell direct; they only sell through mm-hmm. distribution. And uh, but that was that was fascinating to see the stuff. And I, I took some pictures of some of the labels that it's like I had no idea these right. guys made this tobacco, which didn't necessarily mean going back to what we said before about how there's two identical tobaccos with the same label, they're making all different qualities of tobacco. Mm-hmm. And so they are making some of those grocery store and drugstore brands mm-hmm. uh, there at the factory. But that doesn't mean that those are equivalent to, you know, the name brand tobaccos that we buy. Well, weren't they also saying that a lot of the bales of tobacco that they get, the raw tobacco that they're using in their blends, a lot of it is 10 plus years old. Oh, yeah. Too, they that they're pulling, they've, they've got stuff tobacco. in storage. And that a lot of the, uh, there was something too about the Virginia tobacco. Most of it is coming from almost Turkey. All, almost all Virginia right. tobaccos are, are are coming from overseas. Yeah, that was yeah. wild to hear. Yeah, because they they can't get a hold of it. It's all going to cigarettes still. Um, and then also some of their, as they um, at the end of the the process, they capture everything. They they use all of the tobacco that's been that's been blended. And they'll take the fine particles that goes to cigar manufacturers. It gets they mixed with water and turned into a slurry, and they're essentially compressing that down and making paper out of it to make wrappers for some of the machine. The machine, yeah, machine machines that roll yeah. cigars have to have a very homogeneous leaf, mm-hmm. which doesn't exist. So they make that leaf using particles mm-hmm. of uh, it's paper. Yeah, so even what you might think of as their waste is not waste. It's still yep. still being used. It's very smart. Yep. But it's a small company, it seemed to be. The manufacturing floor seemed quite small. Um, but back to what I was saying earlier, they, they, they brought out a bunch of different uh, tobaccos, and we had an opportunity to blend our own, try our hand at blending. And that's tricky. It's It's... You know, it is as simple as just taking little bits and, and mixing it together and hoping that you like what the result is. But I can see where to get it right, to, to nail it, um, where it would take a lot of practice, a lot of a lot of patience. I didn't have the patience. I, I was just smelling them like, yeah, I'll take some of that. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, this smells good. Oh, a little bit of this could be good. Um, and you could create a recipe. Yep. They gave you a card so you could actually have two scales at each table. Four tables with identical blending tobaccos. I think we have your blend here. And I would say there was probably 12 tobaccos or so uh, on the table. Thereabouts. And I took the time to weigh mine out and to, yeah, that says Aristocob. Um, And I created a recipe, which I submitted to them, and they had a little bit of a drawing. And mine was one of the five that was drawn. And that evening they made like 10 pounds of it Mm -hmm. and took it to the pipe show. And then there, it was popular choice. People could could smoke a bowl, or however many bowls, I suppose, yep. of each, and then cast their vote. And the winner of it was going to think, was it a nine-pound block, I think is what they were going to get? Yeah. So oh, Well, they would yeah. make a compressed block mm-hmm. and then slice it and, and tin it up for them, and they would get something like 60 to 80 tins <laughs> of their tobacco. From a, from a nine-pound block. Uh, if you watch the video, uh, we had that. That block and salt showed the compressors. They put 20 tons of force on the tobacco, and they'll 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 compress it. They'll add more to it, compress it, and they press it down. And it is it is solid. You could build a structure with mm-hmm. with those bricks of tobacco. Um, but then they and cut yeah, those a lo- down. A lot of guys. I don't know if you know this. A lot of guys in the YouTube pipe community have done that. I've they, seen. They go to Harbor Freight and they yep. buy a bearing press and uh, make a little mold. To, uh, to hold it. Uh, I know J- Jason Dagner has done it and yep. others have done it. And if you take tobaccos that you know you already like and you compress them, it changes it. Hmm. And not, not the least of which changes the smoking properties because now you have a flake. Yeah, and you can cut it up however, however you'd like. So I didn't win. I, you know, I wasn't thinking strategically. And I actually said to Boy as I sat down at the table, I said, I should have thought this through. I made a tobacco I would like. 
I didn't make a tobacco that the room would like. And I was absolutely right with that because the person who won, they named theirs, what, No Virginia? Yeah. No Virginia. And um, theirs was made completely of, gosh, there was Perique, there yeah. was, um, <laughs> they had some Orientals in there, but just a bunch of different things. And, uh, of course, they won very strong English type tobacco. Right. I mean, the, the, the catch-22 of that is if you are a non-English smoker, you then, <laughs> and you, and you win. win, you get nine pounds of it. Um, but, yeah. All in all, it was, it was uh, a lot of fun. Um, we went straight from that to work travel and then uh, from that to family funeral travel. And so we've just been on the run quite a bit. But, and then we have more travel coming up. So... We'll be shooting yeah. a few videos today. Also, there's a video that is a couple weeks old that hasn't been posted. It'll be in the mix as well. Yeah, uh, I'm, upcoming. But. I'm traveling this week to Atlanta. Come home on Thursday, and then Friday I leave for Germany. And I'll be in Germany and Switzerland for a little over a week. Wow. Yep. Yeah. I'll be going to Massachusetts, New York City, and South Florida for a week and a half. Spe up, so. Speaking of this, and to answer a question I get every now and again, I will be stopping in, in the town where I buy this tobacco, and I've had people ask me, can you get me some tins mm -hmm. of this? And unfortunately, for two reasons, I cannot. The first reason with the FDA, um, corn cob pipes are, are part of the deeming, and these are tobacco. And so while it is possible for us to sell tobacco, because I have a tobacco license, um, this product is not taxed and inspected and brought in. It's probably not registered le as tobacco le legally. by the FDA. Yeah. So, selling this would get me in big trouble. Yeah, um, should be importing. And then there's even the whole sample thing. Well, I'll send you a dollar if you'll send me a sample of it. I can't get into that right now. But yeah. if you ever meet me at a show or a meetup or something mm -hmm. like that, I always have a few tins of this <laughs> yeah. with me, and I'm happy to share it with you. I just can't sell it yeah. or provide it in any quantity to people. I, I get that. I get asked that every time we smoke this. Somebody <laughs> asks, where can I get that? We actually had one of our uh, viewers went to that shop in, right. the, in the Black Forest just to buy that. They took a picture of themselves with their tin out in front of this little shop, and it was that was kind of a, a cool thing that happened. Hope yeah. they liked it. What I'll tell you is... It's an aromatic tobacco, and so unless you like aromatic tobacco, you won't no, like it. No need to worry a about it. A lot of the people we've shared this with out and about um, at meetups and things, they're like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. And that's it. You know, they're, <laughs> they're like, yeah, okay, that's that's fine. Um, you know, it's, it's not for them. As an aromatic smoker, it's really great. I mean, it's complex, and they'll, they'll acknowledge that. But, um, yeah, it's uh, not most people's style. So. Yeah. All right. Speaking, of, speaking no? of that, what did you think of the uh, full aroma amphora? I didn't care for it all that much. That was kind of bitter. Um, I mean, what it you got was, in it? I don't know actually. Does it say? I didn't dislike it, but I didn't really like it. Like it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Centuries. <laughs> Full body blend with a hint of fruit blossom, subtle vanilla undertones, complement the mellow chocolatey burleys, while the Kentucky Oriental and Virginian grade leaves combine for a fruity aroma and a well-rounded smoke. I like it. <laughs> cool. So, all right, we'll wrap this up. And it has we'll, been my uh, filter. That, <laughs> that certainly didn't help. We'll be back next week with uh, another exciting episode of Barkerman's Breakfast Club. We hope that you're a third of that. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make it a great week. See you guys.